Yeah, happy Independence Day uh, once again, and many thanks you know, for uh, staying with us uh, here on to uh, the uh, discussion segment of New Dawn on Ogun State you know, Television. And this morning, it's all about uh, the most populous you know, black nation, Nigeria at 61. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, the past, you know, the present, and the future. And interestingly, uh, we have two academic doctors uh, in the studio. Uh, Dr. Rashid uh, Dituro, and a public analyst, uh, you are welcome to the program. It's my pleasure for me to be here again. And also a political scientist, uh, Dr. Erame uh, Nicholas Idris. <laughs> thank you for having welcome me Welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, let me start with Dr. Rashid uh, Dituro. I think uh, we have two schools of thoughts when it comes to uh, the, should we celebrate or not? Why a school of thoughts uh, thinks, uh, well, we, it should be more of reflections, basically. We shouldn't be ruling out the drums, you know. Uh, another school of thought will tell you why not, uh, despite uh, the diversity, you know, we're talking about six geopolitical zones, um, over 200 million people, over 512 languages, we still remain at, as one. So why not let's uh, celebrate? Well, thank you, the moderator. Well, uh, when you talk about celebration, celebration also includes reflections that you are alive is worthy of celebration. That Nigeria is still an entity is worthy of celebration, like some said. But then our celebration should actually anchor on reflections. Reflections in terms of looking at the past, the present, and then projecting to the future. As we all know, uh, it appears things are not getting better for now. Things are not getting better because when you look back, you will discover that uh, even though no tremendous technological achievements and the like, but then the value system of the past was far better than we have the disease. And that should be the focus of our reflection. In fact, I ask myself, how far have we gone? Where are we? And where are we going? Those are the questions. How far have we gone? Where are we? Where are we going? And so, if we are able to reflect on these three questions, how far have we gone? Have we made progress uh, in relation to the past? Where are we? It's like a, a stagnant pool of water. Where are we going? We need development. We need growth. We need happiness. We need stability. And we need feeling of solidarity and patriotism. So this is the summary. Maybe as the discussion goes on, we may have to elaborate on this. Now, I, I really don't know if you <coughs> listened to the president this morning. Uh, in his speech, he talked about the fact that the last 18 months, really, uh, the last 18 months have been like the most challenging for the country okay. after the civil war. Okay. Now, don't you think that um, we should also cut the nation some slacks? I mean, even the leadership, some slacks. I mean, if, according to the president, the last 18 months have been I'm very happy. turbulent and challenging. Honestly, I'm very happy for that submission of Mr. President. It's a submission out of reflection that if a child of 61 years old is still staggering, has not been able to walk on his feet. Instability is pervasive in terms of kidnapping, in terms of banditry, terrorism, Corruption. and so on. And we find out that we are the ones doing ourselves. Mm. We are the enemies of ourselves. We are the ones generating all these problems for ourselves. Then Mr. President is very right to say 
We have not had it so worse than this in the last 18 months. This is so terrible. And when investigations are done, you will see that people who are custodians of ensuring stability and law and order are culpable. Yeah. Then, would you ask yourself, uh, yourself questions and say, ah, ah, has it been so bad that we, are not yet, we have not reformed ourselves to know the need for peace and harmony to make progress in the society? Now, as we progress in the conversation, we are going to dwell on some parts of um, the president's speech. Uh, but let me come to you. Um, October 1st, really, yearly, um, how do you view that day? Do you look forward to seeing that day? Uh, does it, um, I mean, are you, are you happy that, uh, of what Nigeria is, you know, on October 1st? Uh, do you look forward to even listening to the president's uh, broadcast? I know so, some people, some, I mean, a uh, few years ago would actually look forward to listening to the president. Or let me say, probably in some other climes, they would look forward to hearing their president talk to them on auspicious occasions as such. Do you, look, do you, do you have such feelings? Well, I was just coming in this morning, and the public vehicle, I had to tell the Rather to tune, to tune on the, the sound yeah. so I could listen to some few uh, things the president was saying. Not necessarily because I have trust or believe in whatsoever is coming out from there, but you see, we still cannot alienate ourselves from the country. Mm. We don't have any country than this called Nigeria. Now, you talk about issues of maybe speeches have become so disappointing and all that. It's just a normal thing. And you see, for, for instance, when you see an old man growing, as time goes on, even when the kids want to celebrate his birthday, there are different thoughts. The children want to eat cake, want to cut cake, but the man is thinking that I'm getting old. Where, where am I going? Exactly. Where am I going? <laughs> and you know, sometimes when such a person has not made so much in life, mm. and the kids are trained for a very flamboyant party, mm. you need to know what is in the man's mind. So that the president has said something to this money, for me, it's more like a normal um, October 1 ritual, that the president needs to say something. As so many people feel disappointed. But what we cannot take away from these issues is that there has been a serious or there has been a high level of disappointment across board in terms of governors in the country. And there's a serious alienation, alienation in terms of the citizens and their leaders. And that's why you see that most of our problems have become intractable and very difficult to address. Uh, well, uh, one thing the president has said, or one of the things, one of the statements you know, he made this morning, uh, Nigeria is for all of us, and uh, her unity is non-negotiable. I think the president is right about that, because, you see, I may, a few countries I've traveled to, I, what really strikes me most is that Nigerians in diaspora, they have so much concern about the country, even more than those who are in the country. And now the question I keep on asking is that, it, you know, what would expect that you guys have left? So why are you so much concerned about what is happening? It therefore shows that there's, an, there's a natural affliction that links us up to Nigeria. And for that reason, we must always be worried what comes out or what doesn't come out. Now, when you look at this very well, the president has also made some speech. He said there's no way we call our country. And that's the truth. One. Then two, when you also look at other countries that we want to emulate, right? It is not that it is only the presidency or the president that ensure that those countries are stable or they are fine, right? It's a, it, 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 it's a collective uh, um, responsibility. responsibility. But much of it lies within leadership. And that's why you see, there's never a day people would always want to blame me for the Nigerian problems. I'm, I mean, that's the truth. But we equally have some blames. We share some blames. But the buck always goes to the, um, to the president because it is more like a social contract. You made all kinds of bogus promises and expectations became so high. So and what do you expect from people to say? 
that's exactly that's the normal thing we need to do. And it's not likely going to die off with the, um, the, the, the regime of President Mohamed Buhari. It's, so far, we have this kind of expectation between citizens and disappointments. People would always lay claims. So even to today, people still talk about some of the disappointments within the last regime before President Mohamed Buhari came on board. So we are where, we are where we are, but what it means is that we, when you look at it critically, we see that we are yet you know, to lift. And it's a problem. Because you see, if, a child, if, if, a, if a child is going to stand, you see him, making, he and him or her making some steps of standing up, falling, and some other things like that. But in terms of considering what you have actually achieved over a long time, at 61, 61 years old, I, I mean, if I'm to score it, I'll score it 2 over 10, which shows that we have not actually taken off. Because of, and what makes it more difficult is that as the day proceeds, I mean, progresses, the problems are becoming, you know, more complicated. And you ask yourself, is this how the problems are also in most of African countries and some other things? Of course, we can also borrow some experiences from some other countries, African countries, to see that the challenges are all there. Now we begin to ask ourselves, how do we get out of this issue? Because nobody is going to develop a country for you. We must have that as a fact. The Western world are not going to come to your country to help you develop your country. They can only provide some technical assistance and provide some um, some advices. And most of these advices are not to be taken all because some of these advice also come with some, you know, some cynical uh, moves and motives. Now, how do we build our country? The, the current problem is that how do we build our country? How do we build this nation? Take, for instance, in the last time during the NSAS protest, you saw what happened that there was serious anger across boards. And the, I think the elites or the ruling class also understood that there was a problem. And that's why they began to do some kind of cosmetic, um, you know, palliatives and some other things like that. But where did those things go? Because it is the problem is that one of the critical problems I've also identified with in Nigeria is that we have a weak followership. We are, we are complicated. It's a complicated issue. We have a weak followership. And that's why you see in, in some areas, people try to, uh, you know, they bog themselves down with sentiments of making, you know, making cases for political elites and political parties like they have been, you know, they have been bribed or bewitched to think like that. So in other words, they, they are not able to draw out when um, facts and fictions. And when you have a situation like that, the political elites will only think that they are doing the best. Okay, well, uh, Dr. Adetoro, I think uh, one thing Dr. Rame uh, said is uh, that uh, well, it's not really a leadership problem alone. Uh, followers also uh, somehow you know, call people. You know, how realistic is this? Yes, when you look at it, governance is a collective responsibility, like he said. We only entrust the kind of uh, signposts to the leadership that you are our signposts. These are our collective goals. These are our collective objectives. We believe in you that you will be able to lead us to achieve these collective goals and objectives. But Along the line, the problem is that there's a disconnection between the leaders and the followers. In most cases, the leaders believe they are doing business, while the followers believe that they are representing our interests. How do you match this dissonance? Uh, movements together, two very movements together. And don't forget, leadership is supposed to be by example if you actually want to achieve collective goals and aims and objectives. And they are supposed to be role models. But apparently, right from the aspirations, of the leaders and the followers, there is already a disconnection. Even though the leader will hide that under the fact that I'm part of you, I want to go and chat 
the way forward to achieve our ambitions. But right, right inside, most of the leaders, they are selfish or their agenda. Selfish interests, which they, when they get there, they now pursue. And that's why we're having that disconnection. And in all the so-called advanced uh, systems of the world, the countries that are so advanced, they have that symbiotic and what I call a kind of comradeship aspirations together. And they, what the leaders do is even they use their influence, their wealth, and their power to ensure that they take the followers to the promised land. As against the disconnection in our own land here. And that is why there is need for reflections here and there among the leaders, among the followers. And there must be a, a connection whereby today I expect that there should be a lot of dialogues at different fora to say, where have we got it wrong? You are our leaders. Let the senators the House of Representatives come to their community. I expect them in their community today and call for assembly of the people they represent. And if, if not assembly in terms of uh, direct uh, public side, maybe representatives of the people they represent from different professional groups and say, we have to go to Trump. Are we doing the right thing? Are we leading you are right? Where have we been making mistakes at the leadership? Then where are you also making mistakes at the followership level? So that at the end of the day, the reflection will bring about a, a common sense of responsibility and a common sense of redirection. Maybe, maybe we are able to see um, where the leaders are making mistakes uh, because they are up there and uh, whatsoever they do is actually in the full glare of the masses. But let us look at where the masses are actually making mistakes. Maybe even when the masses correct all of these their mistakes, it will make these leaders to sit up and then sit, um, you know, and then get um, serious with them um, leading us. What are some of the mistakes of um, the masses the over mistakes, the years? The mistakes starts from home. How many of us parents are really correcting in our homes in terms of making sure that our children abide by the ethics and values of integrity at home. How many of us? Let us be searching our conscience. In my own house, I've had cause to be having disagreement. When my wives are partnering my children, I say, no, no, Papa. Mm -hmm. They are on training session. Don't let them see that things are just they are unlimited. Then let them participate also in generating the wealth of the community. I've had calls when I was taking my children to my farm at one day. A colleague in the school was challenging me. Ah, don't give too much pressure to these children. I said, what? The children are spending so much who are going to high schools and I'm committing my sweat on them. So, they will not be part of those who will be generating the wealth. I said, you cannot control my house for me. Leave me. That what I'm taking them to do is what brought me home. Because ethics of work and ethics of responsibility starts from making sure that your children also participate in generating wealth at home. Aside that, what about relationship ethics at home? Are parents correcting the children with the burden? Do you know that they said some parents in this our generation are already even creating institutes of Yahoo for their children? Bankrolling and financing tools for Yahoo making. Are you surprised? Even to the extent that 
some balance, some pastors are also bankrolling spirituality to support their children going uh, flourishing in Yahoo business. What we all abhor in our society, what we condemn as a bad ethics, even what government is chasing out from the society. Some parents are condoning it. They are supporting it for their children. And when they want to give you reason, because there is unemployment, there is poverty in the land, how much of the resources of the land have we explored to elevate our poverty at our individual levels? Positively. But, um, Dr. Rame, yeah. there is much to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Aditulo did talk about you know, disconnection at the other time, uh, but uh, now we're talking about democracy. You know, since uh, 1999, when we returned uh, to you know, democratic rule, uh, I mean, how will you describe that? Because democracy is participatory. We're talking about the government of the people, for the people, and by the people. Uh, but it seems we are not really benefiting optimally you know, from democratic rule. Yeah, I, it's not only Nigeria, people say even Africa at large. Yeah, I think um, you're right because if you look at the, um, the nature of democracy we inherited in the post-Cold War era, particularly after the, um, the third wave of democracy arguments of Samuel Huntington and other scholars like that, we had a, we, we embarked on the democratic experience that, that, that was met with early resistance. So what we had then was uniform men, you know, forcing themselves to be democratic. So the only thing that made them democratic then was that they were removing their uniform, um, military organs for civilian attires. And for them, that's democracy. And because of that, and because of the nature of our political system, we, our mindset and our understanding and most of our political allies, the understanding about democracy in Africa, and particularly in Nigeria, is all about elections. Not knowing that democracy entails a lot of things. Human rights, good road, hospitals, they are all part of democ um, democracy. Mm -hmm. So in a democratic system, we cannot say we are democratic when we are only conducting um, regular elections. But you know, because of the democratizing process that is a bit bumpy, or that, or that has faced a bumpy experience in Africa, we want to measure um, democracy. We see the fact that we have been able to transit from one democratic regime to the other, that means we are democratic. That itself means that is just one, that is not just one aspect, that is just a tiny aspect of democracy. Now let's come back to Nigeria and look at it very well. From 1999 to date, regardless of the party affiliations or regardless of the political lights that have ruled us, let's look at the average citizen and let's see what is the impact of government. First, if you study the way most Nigerians these days build their houses themselves, and immediately they are building houses, they sink boreholes, they provide security for themselves, and that's why you see that there's a failure of security. Now we have all kinds of internal security, um, and Muteku, um, some private boys carrying um, guns about, mm -hmm. guiding streets and some other things like that. And most people provide jobs in themselves. And now the question you ask yourself is that, what then is the real essence of the state? Because the government itself, just like I said earlier, is more like a trust. And the key essence where we have a government is to ensure three things. Welfare, security, and job provision. And if the government cannot provide those three things, then it's as good as, as say we don't have a government. Follow trends very well. You see that uh, most Nigerians have lost hope in terms of government producing these things. So there are results to self help. If you give some Nigerians options not to use the electricity from Nepal and to, to generate that, they will do that. That's why I say that most houses now just rely on um, inverters and all that, all, because they know the government, when large do you hear about water board? When large do you hear about water board? Is water, board, is water not a human rights issue? It's a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. so, so when you look at these things very well, you understand that for me, what we have only achieved 19, from 1999 to date is that we have had a democracy that is 
kind of stable. We have transitioned from one civilian regime to another. And you know, because it can be a problem. Mm -hmm. Because in Africa, we, okay, just um, recently we had a military coup in um, Guinea, mm -hmm. right? And what it means is that in Guinea now, their democratic experience has been truncated. truncated again. They would send them back to maybe 10 years back. Because even if new military leaders who have taken over, you, they would also want to enjoy for one year or two years before they transit power. So, looking at it very well, we then ask ourselves, why is that the problem? The problem, just like I said again, is that look at our political culture. Look at citizen perception of governors. Look at how we rate governors. You understand that the citizens, the citizens really have a lot of things to do. Because in the first place, if a governor or a president builds roads, why do you have to go and hire people to be dancing there? And can you wear all kinds of akara and you go and start, you use one million to commission a borehole of 700,000 era? What is the essence of the government in the first place? So when you have a system where a governor or a president is coming somewhere and some section of people are mobilized and they go and start dancing, he's going to start displaying all kinds of displays, you are creating an impression that everything is fine. Which is not necessarily the case. So we have to move from a level of living under self denial to, uh, to, you know, to coming out to say this is a problem. Now, again, you have also talked about um, that the citizens have a lot to do in any democratic. Of course, they do. So what are some of those things that they should be? Now, let me, now let's look at it very well. Look at our, at our voting patterns. Before elections, we see all kinds of things. People come, they make all kinds of bogus promises and everything like that. And we live on, we live through bad roads. There are so many people whose cars cannot last one year or two years again because they have bad roads. Some of those things, you can't see them in developed nations. Those are fundamental rights. But we live with these things. And when it comes to election time, some people come from nowhere and begin, I mean, begin to tell us all kinds of fictitious statements. They cook up all kinds of stories and make up all kinds of bogus promises, even if that scales through the first time. If you fool me the first time, that's fine. But if you fool me the second time, then I, ha I am the problem. Now, many people complain about political parties and everything like that. What is the level of political participation or the level to which Nigerian citizens who feel they have, um, they have been problematized or who feel problematized with the way the government is running? How are they trying to ensure that they... Did? Because you see, these allies themselves also understand that weakness. So if you guys are not able to mobilize yourself into political parties, if you are not able to form formidable forces, if you are not able to raise questions, they will assume that everything is fine. Deep down, they know that it's not fine. So it becomes a business as usual issue. It's not a, and let me tell you, the, the importance of the citizens is, cannot be over, 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 overemphasized. And that's why at every time they always come back to me and you, you know, to, to converse, to talk about how do we make sure we make a. Now, take for instance in Nigeria, we have not even finished 2021. There are no good hospitals, there are no good roads. So many people have already started politicking for 2023. And what it means is that. We are, in a, we are in a vehicle or in a bus with different agendas. Some people are thinking how they are going to eat this money, while some people are already projecting how they are going to capture power in 2023. Mm -hmm. So it tells you the mindset of the kind of leaders we have. This One, they are reckless. Two, they are senseless. And three, they are very insensitive to the real core challenges of the people. So when they are able to, you know, just ensure that they they pass one few road, they count it as a uh, as as dividend as a dividend of democracy. But when you alert all men, other roads and everything like that, they see that they have not really done so much. Okay. Now, well, uh, talking about agendas, talking right. about agendas, you mentioned agendas earlier, and then talking about agendas, some issues have come up in recent times. Yes. Issues like um, um, open grazing. And then we had them um, south and um, the north having um, to disagree as far as um, open grazing is concerned. Yeah. We talked about VAT, also caused a lot of controversies. We talked about um, uh, even zoning of the presidency, quite a number of issues, secession yeah. calls and the rest of them. Now, when you look at all of these issues, one after the other, would you say that um, we are growing? Would you say that we are moving? I mean, because if we are in a challenge or if we are we are surrounded by challenges. Yeah. We should be seen to be, you know, striding or moving out of these challenges. 
would you say all of these issues that are coming up are issues that are taking us out of the challenges that we have faced as a nation or they are taking us back? I want to point out a missing gap in our democracy as against the way it is practicing the advanced world. It is lack of accountability. And it borders down on uh, the low political culture of the citizens. Nobody calls to question it. How far our representatives have been doing? Are they doing well? Are they serving our interests? Are they carrying our goals across? Nobody. And that is because of poverty of the mind of majority of the citizens. Doctor, are you sure nobody, nobody does that? We do. We do at uh, yeah, my, uh, my, like my microscopic this. level, like this level. We do we, at this we, level. We also have, How many people are looking at we also have, what we are doing here? Yeah. We also have um, NGOs. Yes. Have, um, How many of them are functional now? International. We have um, quite a number of do, them. Do, do, do you know that there are people problems. killed most of these NGOs who could have been vanguard for accountability? by peeping into too much of their privacy and then there is in which they call they are looking at their account they are looking at the source of their money and so whether it could be traced to terrorism uh, terrorist uh, groups and organizations from abroad let me tell you you see the political elite they are very sagacious they know that there are two levels of poverty with which you can make citizens to lose their sense of accountability. One, the first, uh, which is the, lowest, uh, the lower level, is poverty, the poverty weapon. The second one is mental alertness weapon. Once they make you to be poor at these two levels, of course, they will start with poverty. They will fight the citizens with the poverty. With poverty, that's what we are experiencing, and that's why even me and you, our our rights, our even entitlements, we have been denied for some years and so on. Is poverty weapon? Secondly, it would not aggravate. But we have been told that resources are not available. Uh, which resources are not available, but <laughs> we, we can only appropriate resources to where we have interest. Don't tell me that, the moderator. It's only whatever the political elites prioritize that they allocate resources to. Now, as it is, if we have. Roads are still being constructed, even the houses are being constructed, buildings. If we have. Um, I'm sure in the mornings like this, there are tons of media houses who have programs like this, uh, and then they table national issues. They discuss almost on a daily basis with yeah. analysts speaking um, their minds, really, yeah. and then expressing their displeasure over what's happening. How much of our and leaders have been have, able to attract to this forum? They also have the likes of. Even this forum. They also have the likes of Serap. Mm. You yeah. see? How much of our political leaders, those who are representing us, have you brought to come and share and rub minds together with us in this in this kind no, of you see, you, you, you see, like you see, the, I'm not, the you issue, are bringing me, but I've not had opportunity the, to have the some issue of them. At times, it's long time I've had. The issue I at times, there was a time okay. is uh, at least uh, we were together on the, debating the issue of. Uh, Land, uh, land grabbing, okay, and they were about to Open pass that. And yes, and we gave kudos to them, and we also share information. We also analyze issues on land grabbing, and they use it to fine tune. You see, I think we must bridge this gap between the citizens that are being served and the chief servants. They don't, these political leaders don't, don't see themselves as chief servants. That's the problem. Okay, okay well, let us uh, take your thoughts, um, Doctor. Um, Doctor Ramirez. Uh, yeah. Now, um, of course, uh, the great elites, elites have been talking about you know, solutions, and in the southern part of Nigeria, yeah. uh, there have been calls for restructuring, for instance, and then with the VAT controversy uh, that has pitched the north you know, against the south mm. is also part of this restructuring we're talking about. We thought we were saying fiscal, you know, federalism. Uh, but even if that you know, 
comes to the fore yes. or comes to reality, how much of our problems will that solve? Mm. Yeah, you see, I have my fear with <laughs> that because we can't be talking about physical federalism or anything we were restructuring without talking about accountability. Mm -hmm. Because it, it will end up being a, 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 a policy somersault. Mm -hmm. It is not far-fetched. You see, issues, let's take for example, there was a recent report from the Niger Delta about what has been taking place in the NDDC. Are you not surprised that the, all those, the activists and the, um, the, the fathers they have suddenly gone, gone quiet? They have lost their voices because they are complicit in some because of these issues. The 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 issue, who will you blame? Uh, leaders or the followers? No. Who's in charge? We, we get to that. Why don't we now look at the Southwest issues very well and talk about restructuring and some other things like that? These concepts look very, very, they are very cashy statements. I mean, cashy words. Uh -huh. They look cashy. So, you know, some people also just think that when they say restructuring uh -huh. and once you just adopt it, the whole problem in Nigeria is solved. Uh -huh. But we have forgotten over time that human, the citizens build institutions. Uh -huh. And over time, the institutions regulate our collective, um, you know, behavior <laughs> and what that means is that if you say we want to adopt some um, reforms uh, whether they some from college restructuring mm. i will call it reforms and if we are adopting some of these things and we're not able to you know speak to it we we'll end up having a problem that we begin to ask of one other process what is because you see before you also think that you want to restructure you ask yourself where are you coming from what are the challenges you are confronted with? What are the core, what are the genuine efforts you have really adopted in addressing those problems? And if you feel that they are not fine, then you begin to talk about you want to restructure, you want to adopt another system. Then you can also do what they call analysis. You can also do a comparative analysis of similar countries, mm -hmm. similar states who have the same problems, and ask yourself how were they able to get out of these problems? Mm -hmm. Because we don't just begin to hear some kinds of statements and we just jump over it. Mm. As, so, we custom, yes. um, as we cost them, as we cost insecurity has been a major issue as mm. far as Nigeria is concerned. And then recently, the president said it is compiling names of um, financiers mm. of terrorists, bandits in the north, and the rest of them. And after the compilation, unfortunately, they have refused to release these names to the press. But in the president's um, address this morning, the president only talked about. Um, the fact that, okay, let, let me use his example. He said the recent arrest of Inam Dekanu and Sunday Igbo and the mm. ongoing investigations being conducted have revealed certain high profile financiers behind these individuals. <laughs> we are vigorously pursuing these financiers, including one identified as a semi member of the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we hear anything about Boko Haram, despite the fact that they have actually been digging this nation, digging at the soul of this nation for so many years. Banditry that is actually making. That is the rave of the moment in the north. We did not hear about all of this, but we only heard about Sunday Go and Namdekan. Do you think it's deliberate on the part of the presidency? Th uh, thank you, the moderator. You know, the, my colleague talked about we have only been transiting on electoral basis, not actually practicing democracy. Our transition had always been violent. Don't forget the antecedents that led into one successive government over another yeah. successive government. It had always been violent. And that was what imported the issue of this banditry, uh, terrorism, and so on. Because most of the guys that were being used as political, to the, as political talks, once they are godfathers, the political godfathers who no longer finance them, they transform to group of bandits, <laughs> group of terrorists. <laughs> that is it. Have you not read a lot of literature about this? And it has started just three days ago or two days ago. Dr. Aquile, the, the, the husband of uh, that uh, professor, late professor Aquile, Dora. Was killed, was gruesomely, gruesomely murdered in the in the east. Are you thinking? And are you thinking it looks because of the, the tension of political landscape. One could infer that okay. it's more of political target. And it's going, if care is not taken, there is going to be more of it 
2022 to 2023. But the, because whatever we can say, the so-called political elites that are in governance, that are ruling us, only believe in violence to get to their authority. So the leadership is not sincere in its approach and its let me tell you, against insecurity. Let me tell you, to some extent, we, 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 we cannot rule out. Because even within the military formation itself, we were finding accomplices. Okay, well, uh, our time is really fast spent, even though you know, I did talk about restructuring the other time, and embedded in that is also the call for states no police aid. Uh, if we have that in place, uh, don't you think this will also help uh, in the fight against you know, banditry, uh, terrorism, and what have you? The fear is that will these believers of violence not continue to use police state, mm. state police, to governize well, their uh, Dr. Rabe, We yeah. need to reform <laughs> ourselves <laughs> first. Dr. Rabe, we have to that is the thing. Okay. Okay. You're parting short on the program. Yeah. Uh, what's the way forward? I think the way Nigeria forward 61. is that Nigeria 61, we have come this long, but Nigerians really need to come out, you know, take charge of their acti of activities and ensure that they participate purposefully in the electoral process. And they are more concerned about decisions that are taken on their behalf. And they have the will or demonstrate the will to also assess these decisions upon which they use uh, in the long run in arriving at their choice of leaders. Okay, uh, well, uh, thanks for honor our invitation, uh, gentlemen, uh, Dr. Rashid Adituru and Dr. Erame and Nicholas Idris. We'll be back in a moment for another conversation. Stay with us. Agency in conjunction with the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. Salary to it, eh? <laughs> yes, so and Monday never will reach up. That salary plenty, you know. No wonder I'm not going to call a roger for my hand. Check it up, sir. The training and cooperation. If it happen. Lara, come join us now. Not the excitation. Coronavirus still data. So you know go still follow us play again. <laughs> I beg what you be this lara. Life don't turn no manner. But people still they sick. Some they even die for this COVID matter. Why are they correct for the matter? So now what do we go do? Make we they use up they take wash our hands for at least 20 seconds. As we they wash them, make we they sing the happy birthday song two times for our imaginary friends. When we get outside with people, make we they leave space between on ourselves at least six feet. We suppose they wear face masks if we get outside. 
And if person cough or sneeze, they then they bend their elbow or use tissue and throw away and wear well. And I beg my party, it better make una sit down for house if una no need come out. But if they tell a person to stay for inside house every day, you know bam. Can I hear? How you gonna feel if you catch the virus as you they play for yard? Go give your papa, mama, your brothers and sisters them. You did correct, Clara. You know what I'm Make we form one squad, go call them Operation Run House Coronavirus. We go do all the preventive measures we officials don't put in place and encourage everybody to make them do the same thing. Look at that! Sex education is as important to children development as intellectual education. To build children and help them avoid being victims of sexual abuse, there is need to teach sex education. Tell them the importance of effective communication. Teach them moral lesson. Empower the children to say no, even if it is an adult asking them to do something that is wrong. Be careful who your child is spending time with. Most cases of abuse is from close relations. Parent, no signs to look out for in the case of sexual or child abuse. You can give your children code word to use when feeling unsafe. Talk about sex education often. Children of today are leaders of tomorrow. Help children to avoid being victims of sexual abuse. Yeah, uh, welcome back. Uh, well, uh, let's uh, continue uh, with another conversation entirely. And we're looking at the International Day uh, for the Elderly, uh, which is celebrated in October the 1st, you know, every year. And the day is celebrated to raise awareness about issues affecting uh, the elderly. Uh, the theme uh, for this year's celebration is Digital Equity for All Ages. And uh, we have in the studio uh, Oluwa Yemisi Oluwole, who is the CEO of Age Nigerian Foundation. Uh, you're welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, digital equity for all ages is what uh, is the theme of this year's celebration. Yes. Uh, can you tell us more about that? First of all, um, happy International Older Day for our older people in Nigeria. And our theme for this year is digital equity for all ages. Digital equity for all ages is also part of equal rights for all ages. We believe that whatever structure or whatever, uh, in, in whatever things that the government or anybody is doing to help anybody, older persons should be included. We believe in social inclusion. When we are talking about digital, normally people will feel, oh, for children, for the youth, older people have been excluded because they believe they don't need it. And we believe that everything that is happening, every provision that is made for anybody, older people should be included because they also need it. Growing up as a child, we believe children should have a good life, youth should have a better life, other persons you have quality life in older age. No, okay. Okay, when you talk about digital, I mean, what, um, what comes to the mind um, is um, things like uh, all these gadgets, mm -hmm. phones, and the rest of modern technology and the yes. rest of them. Yes. Um, and these also the things you are saying we should put the older generation into consideration. Yes. When we talk about digital, we are talking about the use of our phones, the use of our laptops, our tablets, hundred phones also. And we believe older persons also should be able to handle this gadget you are talking about. Now, what would also come to the mind is some of these people over time have, sh have not really shown interest in things like this, perhaps because they never had the opportunity of having these things around while they are growing up. And um, because they did not show any interest, or because they are not showing any interest, they have also not been able to master, you know, how to use some of these things. Well, I don't believe that 
they do not have interest in this. It is okay that growing up, they might not be able to use this digital equipment we are talking about. But we know that in this present time, uh -huh. if you are not using all those things, you are being left behind uh -huh. or forgotten. Because you cannot communicate, you cannot get some information, and then you don't know what is going on. So all the persons must be carried along. See, the thing is, if you put all the people together and ask them, they would want to. Even those that will tell you that, oh, um, I, don't want, I don't think I need it. I don't think I need it. Maybe because they do not have that knowledge, they don't have the skill to actually use this uh, digital equipment we're talking about, their phones and their laptops. But when you put them through, you train them, you have, make them to have the basic skills of how to use their phones. They will enjoy it because these are the things we are doing in our centers. We teach older persons how to use their Android phone, how to, to communicate with the WhatsApp, be on Facebook, how to search for things. Like we know during the pandemic, we know what happened. It disrupts so many activities and it becomes a blessing to the people that knows how to use it very well. And it cuts off the older people because they, they, don't, they don't know how to use those things to access information, to go to banks, to talk to their children or every other thing. So during the pandemic, it was the older people that was more hit. They have the more hit of this uh, digital mm. kind of information that, we, that happened during, during those times. You know, for youth, they could just get an information of how do I get my food? How do I get these drugs? Those are things that happened during the pandemic. Some of them could not get their drugs. But now that the pandemic has allowed us to see more, and then the world is now tending towards, you know, moving towards that direction of doing things online with their phones and laptops. So older persons should also be able to do that so that they will be able to access the same information children and youth are accessing or communicating with their children on WhatsApp, on Zoom, on Skype, and to get information. So, but apart from uh, information or communication, uh, what else will uh, this add to them? Uh, knowing full well that uh, where a digital world or social media could be very addictive. Well, apart from this, we still have many other people that are active and they still have businesses to do. Mm. It can also help them to take their businesses to another level. It can help them to show the world what they can do. Even those that are just, maybe they just have some petty things that they are making, they can display it on the social media for people to see. And that will, will, will cut away ageism because one would believe that ageism is stereotyping or discrimination against a group of people because of their age, then it will, it will wipe off ageism because we will not believe that everybody should have access to this. Everybody can do this on social media. Everybody should be on WhatsApp. Everybody can be on Facebook. It doesn't matter whether you are old or whether you are young. Okay. Now, it's, it's amazing uh, the, the benefits that um, you have made us to realize uh, could be inherent in um, even the older ones, making use of um, digital uh, technologies and the rest of them. Uh, but beyond this conversation, um, where and how are you taking you know, this issue to, in order to ensure that it gets to those who really need to know and then the necessary things are done probably if possible, you know, um, assisting the older people with, with, um, with um, gadgets. Yes, because when we are talking about digital equity for all ages, one thing, the first thing is to have access to this laptop, to this phone, to the tablet. The second is the affordability, the broadband. How do they have 
how will they be able to afford this internet broadband? And the third one is, even if you have access, you have this gadget, you have this, uh, you have the opportunity of being where you can use your, your, your gadget. And if you don't have the basic skill, it's all useless. It is. You have to have the basic skill on how to use it. So we, have to, we, we are creating awareness and we are also telling people to make sure that they teach their parents, their grandmothers. It doesn't matter. Uh, an older person of 90 years, if you encourage them to use their gadget very well, they find joy in it. Imagine they can call their children or grandchildren outside the country or within outside the state, and they are able to see them and chat with them and talk with them. It's a great joy. It beats loneliness. It beats isolation. It makes them to be able to communicate. It takes away the barrier. Mm. And that is what we are doing. Creating awareness and doing that, and also telling people at the local government and state to include other persons. You have ICT centers all around, but looking at it, you know that other persons are being isolated from using it because they don't believe they need it. But now we are creating awareness. Please include other persons in everything we are, we are doing, including the ICT centers. Let us try and make sure that we invite them. We have youth that can teach them give them the basic needs so that they also can flourish like older generation. Okay, uh, well, away from the field, you know that uh, these days celebrated to raise awareness about issues you know, affecting the elderly. So let's focus on what are other issues you know, affecting the elderly and um, how can we care you know, for, for them? Yeah, we know first thing is the health, health issues for older persons, food, is another thing and that is why our foundation is community based we go out there with our teams of medical uh, experts that attend to older persons we give them free drugs free consultations and later we'll find out that huh, these older persons most of them are poor they need food they ask how can they use these drugs Without food, we decided to add hot meals. Later, we'll find that older persons, some two, three days, they've not eaten because of the cases that we've handled. We had a food box for older people. We call it the food bank project. We gave it to them food that can last them for weeks, for days. And also, not only those older persons that are for other persons that are also collecting pensions. When pensions do not come when it's supposed to come, they are also stranded, no money to eat. That food box that we are giving them lasts them and bridge the gap between that time that they don't have they do not have anything and when the pension will come. And then we we'll also find out that loneliness is also part of the problem of older people. They tend to just stay indoor, nothing, because no recreational centers for them to go out, nothing for them to do. For some people, socializing, they've worked with their, their, their groups, their mates, and then they've retired, everybody have gone their own ways, or their children have gotten married and they lived alone in the house. So we created centers where yeah, other people can come interact, share their experiences. Experts also come to talk to them. They play games. They do a lot of things. Those are the things that we do. And those are part of the problem of older persons that we are trying to, to, to really mm. uh, address. Okay, so do you have them staying in the house or they just come? <coughs> no, they come. Home? It's like a day center. They come. Okay. They gather, they do everything they have to do, they go back to their homes. They have programs, they come, they enjoy themselves, they can come at any time, play their games, 
and do all this. So part of what we are also trying to, 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 to create awareness is that people should also try and help other people in their community. Help NGOs that are also working towards giving them a better life. If we have the funding, we will create more centers. We have more centers in more, in, in more towns and villages where other persons can come out. Now, I, I know you, you have been in this project for quite some time now. Yeah. Um, how, how easy really has it been? And then secondly, how will you rate Nigeria in terms of um, the care and attention we give to the elderly? Okay. Uh, it has not been very easy. Like I, I, I must confess, it's a difficult terrain because people believe older persons should be taken care of their children, taken care by their children, and then they believe they are they are burdened. They do not have uh, this uh, economic uh, productiveness, and then people don't look at them at all. But we believe that older persons have their own way. They have what they have contributed before and what they are still contributing, even in their older age. Can you tell us some of them? So Some of those things that they are still contributing, or we can still have them contribute? Yes, their wealth of experiences mm. that they've gotten can be used by the youth. You know, the youth, the youth have this vibe, they are smart, they are fast. But the older persons have learned through years and have gotten these experiences that they can share with the youths. And the synergy will bring out the fantastic work output. So, you know, other people have served in different ways. You are, you, you are a staff of this place, you get older one day and then you will retire. You have older persons, you have younger persons here that will be doing the work. You have something that you can tell them, oh, this is how we're doing it, oh, can you improve on this? Or they bring a new thing and say, oh, can we do it like this? You are contributing in different ways. But do we, do, as a nation, do we get to tap from, do we take advantage of all of these? Okay, let me say something. We've been working on this, we've been creating awareness, we've been fighting for the rights of older persons, and also telling uh, the government to do something about it. It's a good news that this year, the president has a, uh, created a National Senior Citizen Center under the Ministry of uh, Humanitarian Affairs, uh, Disaster Management and uh, Social Development. And uh, we had a 20-man technical working group that was inaugurated last month, and I'm one of the 20-man technical working group. So it's a good one, it's a good achievement for older persons for this country and we are working towards a strategizing to make sure that the policy, the aging policy that we have for older persons will come to play and then it will be practicable and older persons will be included and their life will be better. So people will not be, will not be afraid to get hold in Nigeria. <laughs> Even people abroad will want to come when, we, when they know that they have, been, they have a better plan for them. Mm. Well, uh, many thanks, uh, Ms. Uluwaye, Ms. Uluwoli. Uh, I wanted to ask the other time that I hope you also you know, educate them on the dangers inherent in the digital world, you know, the cyber crimes. Of course, we, we do that. We tell them do not click on just any link uh, that you have. Don't do this, don't do that. We educate them so that they will not be vulnerable to the hands of uh, scammers. these scammers. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks uh, for coming, uh, Lua Yemisi Oluwoli. Uh, she is the CEO of uh, Age Nigeria uh, Foundation. Well, this is where we draw the curtain on this edition of the program. Many thanks you know, for watching. I uh, will see you uh, again next week. Happy Independence Day. <laughs>